In fact, a lot of people don't believe that Jesus died, especially Muslims. They believe that uh, Jesus uh, was in some kind of a soon position. He was not dead and so when he was put into the tomb, the coolness of the tomb uh, brought him back to life. And, uh, and then I'd like to know how he pushed, the, in that state, how he pushed that mighty stone away that some historians tell us to take at least 20 people to push. And uh, how did he get out? And uh, well, that's what some of them believe, but we don't believe that. You see, after the trial of Jesus, he was found guilty of blasphemy for claiming to be God. John 19 and verse 1 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. A medical expert named Truman Davis studied what this involved and concluded that this brutal beating inflicted on Jesus brought him really very close to death and that is why he could not even carry his cross that's how brutal the beating was jesus was tied to a post and beaten at least 39 times probably even more because these roman soldiers really didn't know how to count better whip that had jagged bones and balls of uh, lead woven into it. And again and again, this whip was brought down on the back of the legs, on the body of Jesus. At first, these heavy tongs cut through his skin only. But as the blows continued to cut deeper, tissues, blood vessels whatever you can imagine was just opened up he was a bloody mess if you saw corrugated iron then it would give you a little idea of how his back looked the balls of lead produced deep deep bruises which really broke into uh, his blood vessels by the end the skin of his back was left hanging in long ribbons and the entire area was unrecognizable a mass of torn bleeding tissue one witness to a roman flogging wrote the sufferer's veins were laid bare and every muscle and tendon and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. Undoubtedly, Jesus was in a very serious, critical condition even before the crucifixion began. It's no wonder he was unable to carry his cross. Then, five to seven inch spikes were driven into his wrists breaking his nervous system and the bones painful i don't think we really understand what painful really means and because of such excruciating pain well, we got the word excruciating simply because it's a word that was coined to describe out of the cross. And so when we say excruciating pain, it's from the original Latin, which really means pain out of the cross. That word didn't exist before that. And so Jesus endured pain that we can never really understand. His wrists and feet were nailed securely and he was hoisted up into the air. And you know, you would think uh, they would do it gently, 
but he was lifted up and slammed into the hole and every part of him just shook with pain you know when they give you an injection you want it done very gently because the pain is so bad imagine this crucifixion is basically a slow death by suffocation because as the body weighs down you need to you need to breathe and in order to breathe you got to lift yourself up and it was the most excruciating time that Jesus went through if a roman wanted to hasten death they used a small mallet to shatter the victim's shin bones so he could not push up anymore if you can't push up anymore then you die faster but as the scriptures tell us that they came to Jesus and he was already dead so they didn't have to break his bones <coughs> nobody came down from a cross alive not even Jesus and so for those people that say that Jesus didn't die they don't know what they say nobody absolutely nobody came out of that experience alive in fact think about this even if you want to believe that think here's jesus somehow if he survived the cross even if he escaped the huge boulder that was pushed against the opening of this enclosure the mouth of the tomb here he was soaked in 75 pounds of spices and we have the very best of gods standing outside watching think of the condition he must have been in when he appeared to his disciples he wouldn't have inspired them with confidence would he and got them all excited about receiving that kind of resurrection body some day he wouldn't have prompted them to triumphantly declare to his people the glorious return and launch a worldwide movement if all of this was a lie they would have been horrified and sickened by his bloody and broken condition so much so that they would have pitied him and gotten him a doctor so the evidence before us clearly refutes the soon theory which by the way people often bring up but no reputable scholars would believe and so let's look at the affirmative evidence for the resurrection let's try to summarize it with just three e's the first e stands for early it's important to reiterate the account of Christ's death burial and resurrection and date that back very early something we must understand was that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not something that came up much later it came up early it was it was a part and parcel of their belief and understanding it was not something they thought about later in their experiences and so early in fact when the apostle paul mentions that 500 people at one time saw jesus he specifically states that many of them were still alive in fact this is the way he probably would have put it 
If people are still around, ask them yourselves. If you don't believe me, they'll tell you that it's true. That's how confident the Apostle Paul was. There were witnesses still around for people to question whether this was true or not. And therefore the proclamation that Jesus was the risen Son of God began virtually immediately after his death. There was no time frame of loss. And so we see early they came with this great teaching because it was true. 500 people already had seen Jesus. And so if you needed witnesses, can you imagine having 500 witnesses and each one if they were given just 15 minutes to speak, how long that would take? 500 witnesses. Early on in the ministry, they were convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The second E stands for the word empty, the empty tomb of Jesus. During his trial, Jesus' chief accuser was the Jewish, Jewish high priest Caiaphas, who served in that position from 18 to 37 AD. It was Caiaphas who accused Jesus of blasphemy for claiming to be God and handed him over to Pilate to be killed. Just about 10 years ago, friends, archaeologists were digging in Jerusalem and they managed to uncover the burial ground of Caiaphas and his entire family. But though his accuser's grave had been found, nobody to this day has ever uncovered the body of Jesus himself. Jesus' body was laid to rest in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Jewish council. And the tomb was sealed and placed under very heavy guard, and yet it was discovered empty on Easter morning. And this is very significant. Several women found it empty. Why is it important that women are involved here? You see, uh, ancient documents tell us that uh, women and their word was not even taken seriously. And so by now saying women saw it, it's like putting a spanner in the spokes. If you really wanted a case to say that Jesus was alive, Rather say men, don't say women. But we have women playing the major role, showing again that the authenticity for the resurrection of Christ didn't need men. Women were good enough, although their word was not even taken seriously in a court of law. Here's the most powerful fact concerning Jesus' tomb. Nobody ever claimed it was anything but empty. Now even his opponents admitted that it was vacant on Easter Sunday morning. They tried to bribe the guards who say the disciples stole the body while they were asleep. Now you know, if the disciples, if they, sorry, the guards um, fell asleep, uh, they would be put to death. That was the punishment. And if you know you're going to be put to death if you sleep, I don't think you'll want to sleep. You'll want to probably stand all night because nobody can fall asleep standing. And so they make this very ridiculous suggestion and these uh, guards accepted it and took the monies and they went and spread the story all over the place. Besides that, how would the guards have known it was disciples that stole the body if they were asleep? If you're asleep, you don't know who stole it, you see. That's how the insurance companies catch people out. Because they say, oh, somebody came in the night, I think it was my neighbor. 
If you were asleep, how do you know it was your neighbor? And so you, you, you let yourself down just with your own words. But the point is, when the disciples declared the tomb was empty, Jesus' opponents didn't respond by saying, No, it's not. Oh, you've got the wrong tomb. His body is over there. Instead, they all admitted it was true. The tomb was vacant. Hallelujah. Well, now the question is, how did it get empty? How did the tomb get empty? Well, let's see how some of these people and what kind of understanding and explanation they gave. The Romans could not have taken the body simply because they wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders wouldn't have taken the body. They wanted him to stay dead. So they weren't going to touch the body. Either the Jews or the Romans would have loved to have paraded Jesus' lifeless body down the main street of Jerusalem because that would have killed this growing movement immediately if they could have had a dead body and uh, gone down the streets, gone up the town and showed everybody, this man who claimed all of these things, he's dead, he's finished. And his uh, followers and disciples would have all run for cover and that would have been the end, total end of Christianity. The disciples had nothing to gain and everything to lose by stealing the body. Why would they want to live a life of pain and suffering and then to be tortured to death for a lie? If this had been a lie, then you could understand why would anybody want to be tortured for a lie? Why would anybody want to go through all the pain and suffering for a lie? Then maybe the woman went to the wrong tomb. Let's uh, suggest. After all, they happened uh, to be going to this tomb in a pre-dawn time. Uh, maybe they lost their way. But that didn't withstand scrutiny either. Not only did Mary Magdalene and other women find the tomb empty, but Peter and John came and also checked it out. What are the odds that they all made the same mistake? And don't you think they would have made absolutely sure it was the right tomb before they risked their lives proclaiming that Jesus was alive? Besides their friend Joseph of Arimathea knew where his own tomb was. And so there was no possibility of them having gone to a wrong tomb. And if somehow they all came down with amnesia, don't you think the Jewish and Roman authorities would have gladly pointed out the, the right, the real tomb, to show that Jesus was still in it? 